All right. Um, welcome to the uh, lecture. Thank you for joining. Um, so today's lecture is going to be about, as Jesse said, uh, it's going to be about decision making under uncertainty. And we are specifically going to talk about two techniques. First one is stochastic programming and second one is um, robust optimization. So before we jump in, I just want to go through the contents. First, um, we are going to talk about the uncertainties in the energy system and what are their types. The second one, uh, we, we are going to discuss um, why we need to deal with those uncertainties and how to deal with them. Third, we um, want to talk about, we are going to talk about how to choose a particular uncertainty analysis technique um, given the uncertainties that you have. And then we'll talk about the state of the literature as of today. And lastly, um, I have two examples. If we have enough time after all of this, uh, then we'll go through them. The first example is about um, the uncertainty in US election. And the second example is about the uncertainty in investment cost and fuel cost and how it affects in capacity expansion decisions. So before starting the class, I just wanted to uh, go through this one figure that has inspired all of my research, dissertation research. Um, so this, on, in this figure, we basically have on X axis, we have years going from 1985 to 2040. And on Y axis, we have natural gas price projection by AEO, which is annual energy outlook. So as you see here, AEO has been projecting natural gas prices, the black lines since 1985, and red line basically shows the actual realization of natural gas price. So in 1995, for example, the projected cost of natural gas was three times higher than what was realized. Even now, even as the years progress, the error in this uncertainty has not improved, right? This is the current cost projections and this is where the cost is going, right? So this is why we need to take into consideration the uncertainties in cost projections or parametric uncertainty in our models. So there are, as Jesse said, there are two types of uncertainties. The first type of uncertainty is parametric, which arises from the fact that some of our coefficients in our optimization model, which can be say cost coefficients or um, constraint coefficients or right-hand side of the constraints, those can be uncertain. And they can be uncertain because of uncertain demand projections, uncertainty in fuel prices, investment cost, or policy uncertainty, et cetera. And then there is another kind of uncertainty, which is the structural uncertainty, right? So we have two types of uncertainty. And the structural uncertainty arises from the fact that we cannot exactly model the real world process as they are. So in the next lecture, we are going to talk about the structural uncertainty, but in this lecture, we are going to focus only on the parametric uncertainty, right? So before jumping into the techniques, let's first talk about why we need to do or why we need to deal with this uncertainty, right? So we have been kind of consistently increasing the complexity of our model as we go through this course. And no matter how sophisticated we make our models or how complicated models, uh, however complicated we make our model, it is still some form of approximation of reality, right? And if we provide a single answer from our optimization model, that is a single um, outcome for policymaker to look at, then it might create biases um, in their understanding of the policy. So instead, uncertainty analysis lets us provide a set of outcomes, assuming different realization of our uncertainty. It also lets us identify what factors of our model has the largest impact on the system outcome. So in that case, for example, if model figure out, figures out solar PV cost has the largest impact on the system out outcome, then we can put more efforts into resolving that uncertainty, right? The fourth reason is that the cost of doing this analysis is usually very small as compared to the cost of not doing this analysis, right? And the last reason is that um, 
if we document all of these uncertainties, then somebody in the future who wants to um, consider these uncertainties can focus on few uncertainties that we um, think are more most impactful. Right? All right. So let's jump into stochastic programming. So we use stochastic programming whenever we have some information about probability distribution um, of the scenarios or of the uncertain parameters. So in the deterministic optimization problem, we have a certain knowledge about um, our parameters, but in the we use stochastic programming when uh, we have some kind of distribution of those uncertain parameters. So goal of this stochastic programming problem is, um, give me one second. So the goal of this stochastic programming problem is to find a feasible solution that works with different possible realization of your uncertain parameter, right? And um, we want to minimize some sort of expectation of some function depending on that, that depends on the uncertain realization of the, uh, of the realization of the uncertain parameters, right? All right, so to talk through, um, instead of like directly jumping into the stochastic linear programming formulation, let's talk about a simple example, right? So in this example, we are going to do some calculations. So if you can just keep your pen, pencil, calculators ready, uh, we are going to do some small calculations. All right, um, so let's assume that there is an island in Hawaii and Mr. Z owns that island, all right? And there are a few residents in that island. So Mr. Z is responsible for supplying electricity and he has three options. He has gas generator, he has wind turbine, and he has solar PV, okay? For simplicity, let's assume that tomorrow is going to be either windy or sunny. There is nothing in between. And Mr. Z has to make a decision today about which generator he's going to use tomorrow. Okay. So if it is windy tomorrow, then wind turbine is the most profitable um, choice. And if it is sunny tomorrow, then solar PV is the most profitable choice. Okay. So this table basically shows the potential profit if he uses a particular kind of turbine or particular kind of resource, and if it turns out to be windy or sunny. So for example, if Mr. Z decides to use all wind turbine, and if it turns out to be sunny, uh, sunny, then he'll he will lose $10. But if it turns out to be windy, then his profit will be $100. Right? So, we want to calculate the expected profit of each resource. So the expected profit of wind, if you want to calculate, will be P, will be the pro that is the probability of tomorrow being windy into the profit um, of the wind turbine when tomorrow is windy. So it is P multiplied by 100 plus one minus P multiplied by minus 10, right? So wh what we want to do is given this um, metrics or profit metrics, we want to figure out a strategy that maximizes his expected outcome or expected profit in this case. So to start with, um, Mr. Z decides that, okay, maybe tomorrow is going to be 50% sunny or 50% windy, then we might use, let's say, half solar and half wind. So if he decide, decides to do that, then our expected profit will be calculated for each resource as given in here. So for wind, it is minus 10 into one minus P plus 100 into P. For solar, it's similar. Um, and for gas, irrespective of what the weather is like, we pay the same amount. 
right? So the expected profit will be 0 0.5, which is 50% wind, into the expected profit of wind, plus 0 0.5 into expected profit of solar, plus zero multiplied by expected profit of gas. Right? So the total um, cost would be 22.5 plus 17.5 plus zero, which is $40. Now I'm going to give you a minute to figure out if this is an optimal solution. And if not, what you think might be an optimal solution. So you could compute. Um, so we want to figure out which generator is going to give us the highest expected cost given that the probability of tomorrow being windy is 0.5. Any guesses what we should do tomorrow? How much percent of wind, solar, and gas we should use? Wouldn't it just be more profitable to just run gas all the way because that would generate more expected profit just right. with gas? Right. So if we use just the gas turbine, then the expected profit is zero multiplied by the expected profit of wind plus zero multiplied by expected profit of solar plus one multiplied by the expected profit of gas, which is equal to $50, right? So the expected profit in behaving optimally was 25% better than the profit in behaving reasonably. So the, what we learn from this is that the average solution is not necessarily the best option, right? We cannot just replace um, the value of the random parameter by their mean value or the average value and take a decision. Also, whatever decision we take today, based on several different outcomes of tomorrow, the average of all those decisions is not necessarily also the best outcome. Right? So this figure kind of tells um, the situation in the perfect sense that for example, if this man is walking on the road, the average state of this man at this position is alive, but the, average, the state of this man at the average position is alive, but the average state of this man might be dead. So considering uncertainty or not considering uncertainty might have a very big impact on your system outcomes. Okay. So now let's jump into the two-stage stochastic programming problem which is the most widely used stochastic programming problem. Um, so in this problem, what we need to do is we, the decision maker makes decision in the first stage, right? Then a certain random event occurs in the second stage. And as a result of that, the, out, the decision of the first stage is impacted, right? So, we need to create a recourse decision such that the bad outcomes or the bad effects of the first stage decisions are minimized. Right? The optimal solution of this two-stage stochastic programming problem gives us a hedging strategy for the first stage, it gives us one single solution or one single decision that we need to make today and then it gives us a set of recourse decision for the next stage, depending on which outcome of the uncertain parameter is realized. Make sense, any questions? All right. Um, so assume that this is your problem. This is your minimization problem subject to these constraints. So X here is the first stage decision, right? And Y here is the second stage decision. We have constraints related to first stage, and then we have constraints that are binding the first stage decision with the second stage decisions. So for example, we have this first stage decision, which is X. And then in the second stage, we have different realizations of uncertain parameters. Say we have n realizations of uncertain parameter. 
so we need to make a decision why considering all of these uncertain realizations right so we reformulate our original least cost problem as this where we minimize the cost of first stage plus the expected cost of the second stage right so the this inside function here is the optimal value of the second stage problem assuming a certain first stage decision so we are minimizing this objective function subject to whatever decision we made in the first stage plus the decision that we would make in the second stage given the given this particular uncertainty realization any questions about this yeah i have a question so how do we exactly come up with the assignment of probabilities or the particular distribution that we are following right so there are um different techniques that we could use before jumping into stochastic programming problem to figure out probability of each scenario for this um i mean you could have different distributions like log normal distribution normal distribution z bo distribution um and you could use those distribution to assign the probabilities for each scenario but we are not going to uh, dig into that in this lecture that is for another um set thank um, you in this case we are only assigning arbitrarily assigning for now um probabilities for each scenario all right so this is a two stage stochastic programming problem which we can extend into a multi stage stochastic programming problem where we have multiple scenarios um at each time stage right so these circles here are called nodes of the scenario tree and the nodes at the last time stage which is the time stage n here are called the leaf nodes right so the multi stage stochastic programming problem will then be modified as minimize your first stage decision plus the expected cost of the next stage where the expected cost of the next stage is equal to the cost of the next stage plus the expected cost of the stage after that right so the q uh, the q function here is again a cost of each of that node given the decision made in the prior stages right so now if we have the previous problem that we discussed if you want to model that as a two stage stochastic programming problem then we have today which is stage 1 and we have to make a decision x and tomorrow which is stage 2 which has two scenarios windy and sunny with probability p and 1 minus p and this first scenario has can create this much profit right where y1 is the amount of wind generation that you would want similarly for y2 and y3 so note here that in this example we did not have any cost for making that decision today okay right? so c transpose was zero because of that the problem formulation would be like this so it does not have the c term it only has the expected cost or expected profit in this case so p multiplied by the expected profit if it is windy plus 1 minus p multiplied by expected profit if it is sunny subject to y1 plus y2 plus y3 equal to 1 make sense so the optimal solution if probability is 0.5 um will be in this case to not generate any um electricity using wind or solar and just use the gas turbine but if the probability is 1 then in this case the 
solution would be 1 comma 0 comma 0 which is use all wind right so one more thing um, that stochastic linear programming problem tells us is or gives us is EVPI and ECIU okay so EVPI stands for the expected value of perfect information so if I tell you that if I go to Mr. Z and tell him that I know what is going to happen tomorrow I know what the weather is going to look like so EVPI tells us the maximum money he will be willing to pay me if I know the perfect information okay so the formula for EVPI is given by this where profit pf n is equal to the profit made if i had a perfect foresight about scenario n right so we sum over that profit assuming different scenario outcomes minus the profit of a hedging strategy right so the hedging strategy in our case uh, was just to use the gas turbine so and the profit made using that hedging strategy was just $50, right? So the EVPI would be the profit um, that I would make if I knew that tomorrow is certainly going to be windy, I would have made $100 of profit, right? Or if I knew that tomorrow is definitely going to be sunny, then I would have made $60 of profit, both of which is higher than your hedging strategy. So if I knew the future with perfect certainty, then I would have made money on that. So which is calculated as EVPI, right? The next thing is ECIU, which is again uh, widely used in SLP analysis. So it gives us the expected cost of ignoring the uncertainty, which is if I take a decision assuming that tomorrow is going to be windy, but I, it turns out to be sunny, then how much am I losing? So ECIU is given by this formula. So the profit that I could have made with my hedging strategy minus the profit for the N for the realization of the scenario, if I make a decision based on a naive scenario. Make sense? Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, could I ask a quick question? So mm -hmm. these terms are function of P N or P, a set of P's. Mm -hmm. Sorry if you've already said this, but are the P's no knowable somehow to us as the researchers? Right, so in here, in this example, we are assuming that P is known. So in stochastic linear programming problem, we have to define the, the distribution beforehand. So if we have 50% probability of wind and 50% probability of solar, uh, of windy day or sunny day, then Pn will be sunny, uh, will be 0.5 for windy and 0.5 for sunny. But in, even if we know that distribution, when doing the SLP analysis, if we decide to ignore that, right? If we decide to ignore the uncertainty analysis and make, um, make some decision based on a naive solution for ECIU or make some decision based on a perfect foresight, then EVPI and ECIU gives us the cost that we could have saved or the money that we lost, we could lose. Cool, thanks. So we don't see these as a function of P, we just see them as like a, and something that we know. But of course, if P changes then EVPI, we could assume different probability distribution and compute different EVPI. Yeah, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So is this EVPI sort of the amount of money that we would pay for a perfect weather forecast? Yes, exactly. Okay. So yeah, if it's the amount of money a decision maker is willing to pay to resolve the uncertainty. So again, going back to the example that we were doing, uh, I gave out this, okay. Anyway, so 
for calculating EVPI, right? If we had a perfect foresight, that means if we knew that tomorrow is going to be windy, then what would we decide? We would decide to use just wind because it's going to make us the most profit, right? So if tomorrow is going to be windy, then the perfect foresight would tell us to make $100 of profit. Or if we knew that tomorrow is definitely going to be sunny, then the perfect foresight would give us $60 of profit. Right? So 0.5 is the probability of tomorrow being windy. And again, 0.5 is the probability of tomorrow being sunny. So the expected value of perfect information is 130 minus, sorry, 80 minus 50. Right, which is thirty dollars. So the so Mr. Z in this example will be willing to pay somebody thirty dollars to know what tomorrow is going to look like. Okay. So next we calculate ECIU. Um, so we would want to calculate ECIU assuming that tomorrow is going to be windy. Right. So if we want to calculate um, a profit of scenario realization N, assuming tomorrow is going to be windy, then what would be our ECIU? So for, so if we make a decision assuming tomorrow is going to be windy, our maximum profit can be $100. But if it turns out to be sunny, our minimum profit is going to be minus ten dollars, right? So ECIU for this decision, which is made assuming the windy weather, is resulting five dollars, right? Similarly, if we make a decision assuming that tomorrow is going to be sunny, then we could potentially lose, not like the decision maker could potentially lose fifteen dollars. So the average of these two, I mean, probability weighted average will be $10, which basically means that, say I'm a consultant, right? And if I go to Mr. Z and tell him that, okay, I can do all of this fancy or stochastic programming analysis, and I would charge you some money for my analysis. My analysis will give you hedging strategy, so you could save potential losses. So at maximum, Mr. Z will be willing to pay me $10 because that's the maximum he could lose, right? So he'll be willing to pay $10 for my consultancy fee. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. Did anybody so, have a um, the EVPI refers to if, oops, oh, I guess I'm a little late. Can you hear me? Yes. So the EVPI refers to my cost for, um, or paying for a perfect weather forecast, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And the ECIU refers to my cost um paying for paying for the um uh best strategy yes it is a cost when i that don't have one right yeah. mm -hmm. so if you make a decision based on a hunch and if it if your hunch turns out to be wrong then that's the cost that you would have to pay or that's the profit that you would lose mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. So, yeah, it's the expected value of your strategy across all realizations. Yeah. All right. So I have included one more problem here. Um, so for example, if now we have a cost of making a decision today, okay? For example, if we have to pay $10 for deciding to build deciding to use wind turbine tomorrow, 
Similarly, for solar and for gas generator, we have some cost. Then the problem formulation would add that cost term in the objective function. Right? We have a cost of making that decision today. So the updated problem formulation will have this cost term in the objective function subject to whatever amount we decide to use tomorrow has to be less than or equal to what we decide that we would use tomorrow. Make sense? So this will be the updated problem formulation. I'm not going over it here, um, but if you would like, you could solve it um, at home uh, just for practice. Um, okay, so to summarize um, the stochastic linear programming problem, um, the best thing about it is it provides one single hedging strategy, right? If you go to a decision maker, the one thing that they want to know is what to do given all of these different future uncertainties. So it gives us one hedging strategy. It also lets us calculate the EVPI and ECIU that lets us kind of quantify the value of our analysis, right? But then it has two major problems. The first one, biggest one, is the curse of dimensionality, right? So in our example, we had just two seasons or like two scenarios and two time stages. So the number of leaf nodes will be n to the power t minus one, which will be two to the power two minus one, which will be equal to two. But for example, let's say if we have five scenarios, it could be rainy, windy, sunny and windy, sunny and rainy, or rainy just. And if we had to use, um, if we have to make decision for next 10 days, right? So it will just blow up the entire problem. And we will have around 2 million leaf nodes and that problem will become next to impossible to solve without using any other techniques. So this is basically the biggest problem for the SLP. The second big problem for SLP is that we have to predetermine the probability of each scenario. Right? And if we change that probability distribution, it can severely affect the outcomes that we have. Um, so these are the two biggest problems with SLP. Um, so I'm going to move to robust optimization next. If you guys have any question about stochastic linear programming, let me know. Um, or I can move to the robust optimization in a minute. Anybody has any questions about SLP? Um, how much is this used uh, like in practice, um, like to for actual like utilities and things like yeah. that? It's a good question. Um, it has been um, since say 1990s, people have started using it more and more um, in at least in the research for energy and power system modeling. But at the utility level and at the policy making level, it's still uh, not very widely used. Um, I have included a graphic at the end of the uh, presentation just to show you how it has been evolving. Um, but yeah, not much. It should be used based on my dissertation, but not much. So is that a similar to, <clears throat> very similar to the SGDP thing that um, Nestor also presented? And um, is that used for the hydroelectric uh, scheduling thing, right? It's the same model. Yeah, it could be used, yes. And it has been used but only for the research purposes, as far as my knowledge is. Yeah, and dynamic programming is an a different solution yeah. strategy than this, yeah. this kind of multi-stage stochastic yeah. framework, which effectively converts the stochastic problem into a single monolithic optimization problem. Mm -hmm. so yeah. as, as dynamic programming doesn't solve it in that way. It solves it through a sort of an iterative forward and backwards you know, path, path kind of approach which can be more computationally efficient if you're doing approximate dynamic programming or other methods. Right. Which is a whole other field of research that we won't talk about. <laughs> it does yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So moving on to the robust optimization problem. Um, so with SLP, we have certain benefits and certain limitations. We have to pick a scenario. We have to specify a probability distribution. It is computationally expensive. We could have infeasible solutions in the sense that if we take a decision based on only two scenarios, which is just tomorrow can be just windy or tomorrow, tomorrow can be just sunny. But what if it turns out to be rainy, right? Whatever your hedging strategy is might not work in that situation. So some, it can lead to infeasible solutions. One more thing about stochastic linear programming problem is that if there are correlation in the uncertain parameters, then it makes the problem complicated. But the good thing is it has been widely adopted and it has been increasingly adopted uh, in the literature. So we have some ref something to reference to, unlike robust optimization. So for the robust optimization, we can specify a range of uncertain parameters instead of just specifying discrete values. We do not need to specify any probability distribution. It is not computationally expensive. So SLP increases exponentially with number of uncertain parameters, but robust optimization increases linearly, at least the formulation that I'm going to talk about today. Um, infeasibility is not as bad in the sense that we still could um, experience some infeasibility in the problem if a certain range exceeds, if a realization of uncertain parameter exceeds the range that we have specified, um, but it's not as bad as the SLP. There is a way to consider a correlation in the robust optimization formulation. And the only little bit difficult thing is to, it's a bit difficult to wrap our head around. So it's, and it's not widely used in the literature, at least for power system and energy system planning. Okay. So it was developed back in 1973 by Soister and his approach basically created a nonlinear version of the least cost problem that provided the most conservative solution given the future realization of uncertainties. So for example, if we have X1 and X2 variables, and if these are the potential realization of uncertain parameters, then Soister's formulation only looked at the intersection of these feasible spaces, right? Which leads us to, to a very conservative solution. So what has happened over the last 30 years, um, people have developed a way to define conservativeness of the solution. Okay? So they have defined a um, parameter called budget of uncertainty. So if budget of uncertainty is zero, it means that we do not care about uncertainty and we will just take a decision based on nominal values of the parameter. And if budget of uncertainty is n, which is the number of uncertain parameters, then we will uh, get the same solution that Soister's formulation would get, right? So this budget of uncertainty parameter basically lets us define the risk averseness or the risk taking ability of the decision maker. So for example, if A, B, and C are three realizations of the feasible space, the deterministic problem will show you just one solution that maximizes whatever cost function we have or whatever function we have for X1 and X2. Then we have these two more realizations of uncertainty parameter, uncertain parameters. And by specifying the budget of uncertainty, we can specify how many of these realizations we want to consider while making, while getting the solution strategy, right? So for example, if we want to consider these two realizations, then this solution strategy would be somewhere in between the uh, most conservative and least conservative solution, right? So over the time, there is one formulation that has stood out, which uh, makes perfect sense given the type of uncertainty that we have in um, power system models, which is a formulation by Burstimas and Sim um, in this price of robustness paper 
it's an amazing paper if you get a chance to read it okay so it has um, some benefits first again it can define range of uncertain parameters okay um it keeps the model linear which is very important given the large size of the real world um power system problems which means it is not computationally expensive and it is it lets us specify a correlation between the uncertain parameters okay so the general philosophy of this uh, approach is that if we have say 100 uncertain parameters in the system right so in general not everything takes their worst case value at a time only a portion of that parameter takes can take worst case value at a time okay so for example if we have 500 uncertain parameters then probability that at least one of them taking worst case value is 50% right but the probability of n of them taking worst case value decreases rapidly and burstimas and sim formulation says that if you have 500 uncertain parameters a probability of more than 65 of them taking their worst case value is practically zero yeah so what this formulation does is it finds those 65 parameters that has the biggest impact on the objective function if our problem had 500 uncertain parameters so this x axis on this x axis a decision maker can specify okay i am okay with 30 parameters taking their worst case value okay so probability of 30 parameters taking their worst case value is 10% right so that will define our budget of uncertainty parameter and we can get a robust strategy for which we can find um 30 uncertain parameters taking worst case value and it will find us the impact of that those 30 parameters on the objective function okay so again going back to the problem that we had before now um instead of having just two scenarios we have the extreme conditions so for example a profit of wind turbine ranges between 100 and minus 10 similarly for solar pv and similarly for gas turbine so the nominal value here for wind turbine is 45 dollars which is the mid range middle of this range so p1 not equal to 45 p2 not is 35 for solar similarly p3 not is 50 and we have a range of all of these uncertain parameters and we have delta p1 delta p2 and delta p3 which is the distance from the nominal value to its extreme value so the formulation changes like this okay so we want to maximize the profit where profit is uncertain so one limitation of burstimas and sim formulation is that it can only take into consideration the uncertainty in constraint coefficients now this formulation is only one type of robust optimization formulation robust optimization formulation is a concept right so we can create different formulation based on what kind of uncertainties we have but right now i am only telling you about the uncertainty in constraints so we move this objective function into the constraint form by introducing a dummy variable next we want to formulate we want to kind of split this objective function or that in the constraint form into two parts okay the first part is the profit at the nominal value and we split it into the next part which is maximizing the best case profit now we can also formulate robust optimization problem as minimizing the maximum regret mi minimizing the best case value maximizing the worst case value or 
vice versa. In this case, I'm formulating it as maximizing the best case profit. Yeah. So for a given value of Y, we solve this problem, maximization problem, where S becomes a variable and Y becomes constant, where S belongs to this set. So S belongs to plus minus one, ranges with, within plus minus one, and mod of S, summation of mod of S is equal to the budget of uncertainty. So if the budget of uncertainty is zero, it means all of these S will take value zero and we will only solve the problem based on the nominal values, right? So instead of solving this um, iteratively, we use um, the duality theory for simplifying this problem formulation. So we write a dual of this problem, which turns out like this. And the duality theory basically says that if you have an LP, linear programming problem in a standard form, and if it has a feasible solution, then the objective function value of the primal problem will be exactly equal to the objective function value of the dual problem at the optimal solution, right? So we can basically pick up this problem and place it in terms of this maximization problem. Yeah. And then the resulting formulation would look like this. Now note that this formulation might not necessarily give you the solution for the problem that we are looking at because two things. First, Burstima sensing formulation works only when the number of uncertain parameters is large, right? So that the probability distribution that I showed you, that probability distribution works when n is large. And in, the, in case of practical problems, large n is around like something more than 50 or 100. Okay. So this formulation would not work for the small test case problem, but it still shows you how the formulation looks like. Okay. One more thing about the Burstyn mass and sim formulation is that your distribution of your uncertain parameter has to be symmetrical. So the nominal value has to fall between uh, at the mid of the uncertainty range. So if we have, for example, uncertainty in investment cost, which says that your investment cost will stay the same or it will decrease by say 50%. In that case, the uncertainty bounds are not symmetrical. So we won't be able to use the formulation as it is. But there have been um, certain, form, certain modifications of this formulation that lets us consider symmetrical, asymmetric distribution, but I'm not giving that here. Okay. So the good thing about robust optimization is that it again lets us identify strategies that are robust based on the risk taking ability of the decision maker. Right. And it also let, tells us about which parameter has the largest impact. Yeah, remain. So this function is going to tell us which parameter has the largest impact out of these three on the objective function value. Okay. So it kind of combines some aspects of stochastic programming along with the sensitivity analysis and gives us a range of solutions that are progressively less sensitive towards the realization of the uncertainty. All right, I'm going to take a pause here. Anybody has any questions? Please let me know. Any questions? Someone wanna try summarizing the difference between stochastic and robust approaches? Oh, I summarized it in the first slide. 
I know. I want to see if they, oh. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> and okay. what an example of when you might use one approach or the other. Yes, I, that's coming in the next slide. No, I want to see if they have, <laughs> oh. <laughs> just to okay. see if they're tracking along the, <laughs> the process right. here. Okay. Yeah. So anybody want to take a crack at that? What, why would you, when would you use robust versus a stochastic approach? You think of any examples? It doesn't have to be energy related. It could be something else. Seems like if you have a good understanding of the probability distribution over your outcomes, you're destroying information. If you use the, is, if I'm understanding it right, you're destroying some of that information by using the robust optimization, um, I think. But then in reality, like it must be quite rare that you have a really good understanding of your, you know, uncertainty over your future parameters. Yeah. So can you think of some practical examples that that might make sense? Maybe for like Which, short run weather forecasting where you've got a pretty good understanding of like two days ahead mm -hmm. or one day ahead, um, but you've got a really bad understanding if it's more than that, I think. So. Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of decision making processes would you want to employ a robust strategy? You know, we all make decisions under uncertainty all the time. So this could be an example from your <laughs> from your experience. Or if you you know, say you could actually sit down and run the optimization. Usually, we can't. Um, what kind of decisions do you make that you might want to use a more robust technique? Uh, make sure you have enough money in your retirement account. Yeah. So you you don't know what the long term probability distribution of things is, and you definitely are more risk averse to running out than uh, you know than to uh, you know giving up some upside. So as you get closer and closer to retirement, at least the typical advice is to become more and more conservative in your approach to the uncertainty that you face. It's a good example. Conversely, if you're a financial trader and you've got plenty of liquidity, maybe you take a fully stochastic approach and you build a fancy stochastic model of how the stock market moves, feed it with lots of information and use it to predict things. Other examples? So one from power systems that is commonly you know, considered as not actually used in technically, you know, using a robust optimization framework, but the um, planning of operating reserves um, is done in a robust manner in, in the sense that we use, system operators typically use some heuristics and, you know, expert knowledge to define what they think are the most likely contingencies to plan for. Again, with the assumption that not all of those contingencies will happen all at once, right? You're not likely to, you know, there's some correlation between plant failures, but not all of them. So, they plan for one or two major contingencies that would happen at the same time that they know would stress the system to the greatest degree and uh, make sure that there's enough um, flexibility or recourse in your second stage decision to be able to deal with that. Um, sometimes that's most of the time you're over committing generation that you don't need, right? So in, in expectation, that's a money losing strategy. Uh, we have generators online that aren't being used on average, you know, most of the time. But in that one case where your, you know, two gigawatt nuclear plant trips offline in with no notice, uh, or a power line goes down and you lose three gigawatts of imports into your system, uh, you want to be able to respond to that quickly. Otherwise, the expected cost or possible cost of that low, you know, low probability, high impact event is huge. So in a lot of cases where we have this sort of, you know, low low probability but not knowable with perfect foresight, you know, no, you don't know the probability distribution well. But it's relatively low with a high cost impact. You often deploy a risk averse strategy, and robust optimization is a good way to address those because there's only a limited set of scenarios that you actually want to plan for in that case. Yeah. And um, it's, with power system planning, planning, if you are investing in a certain um, generator, then you want to have that minimizing the maximum regret strategies or just um, minimizing the worst case outcome of your decision. So there, the robust optimization makes more sense. Um, 
Okay, so I have kind of created this flowchart about when you have a question about which uncertainty analysis technique we should choose. So first question we ask is whether we know the key uncertainties in the system, right? If we don't know those key uncertainties, then we use the method of Morris technique that we talked in the previous lecture. And that technique will give us the key uncertainties in the system that we uh, want to analyze. The next question that we ask is whether we want a planning strategy. If we don't want a planning strategy and if we just want to understand the overall relation between the input parameters and the outputs of the system, then we usually end up doing the sensitivity analysis, which is probably most widely used for policy analysis. But if we do want a planning strategy, assuming all those future uncertainties, then we ask the question whether we have the uncertainty related information. Right? If we have the probability distribution, if we have, if we can form a scenario tree. If we don't have that uncertainty related distribution, then we go to, uh, then we end up choosing the robust optimization formulation. But if we do have the uncertainty related information, then we again have to think about dimensionality of the problem. So just having access to the uncertainty, the probability distribution does not necessarily mean that we should use stochastic programming. So if we, if the dimensionality of the problem is relatively low, then we use stochastic programming. But if it explodes again, then we end up using robust optimization. Um, so the status of the literature as of 2018, these are basically, um, this is the status of the literature in the energy system optimization problems, majority of which uses the deterministic solution. So most of the analysis that is done that informs policy has been used, has, has used um, just the least cost formulation. But in the recent years, we have started using some of the uncertainty analysis techniques and out of which majority of which has been two stage stochastic programming problem, especially regarding the uncertainties in policy realizations. So because it is relatively easier to model, you only have outcomes such as whether we have a carbon cap or whether, or whether we not have a carbon cap or whether we have X percent RPS or Y percent RPS policy. So these policy realizations are kind of easier to model with stochastic programming. And in the recent years, um, also lots of analysis has been done using Monte Carlo analysis, which we had thought, I think again, um, spoke about in the last lecture. And the two new topics, which is robust optimization and modeling to generate alternatives, these have been kind of start, it's, people have started using these at least in the research purpose uh, for addressing the uncertainty in the model. Um, so I have to, I'm not sure how much time do we have. Do we have time for both the examples or do we have time we for- We have about one? 15 or 20 minutes. So um, decent amount of time left. Okay. Should start with the first one, yeah. All right, okay. So the first example is about um, kind of creates again an island system that has different end use service demands different resources to use uh, that are converted to electricity and different fuels that are used to satisfy the end use energy service demand so we have in general 27 technologies and um, we have four model time periods and we are splitting each year into six time slices so it's a very crude representation of the entire year, um, time series data for the entire year. So the case study uh, that we created, assume that in on that island, we again have presidential election every four years. And if a green party wins the majority, then they implement 2.3% cap on CO2 emissions annually. And if the pro-business party wins the election, then we don't have any cap on the CO2 emissions. Okay. So we assume that um, the election probability is 50-50% and we try to compute the expected cost of ignoring the, um, the election-related uncertainty 
and the expected value of knowing the results with perfect foresights. Okay. So we are in 2020, we have an election and we have election for again, next two time stages. So the number of leaf nodes here is two to the power four minus one, which is eight. And since we have equal probability for each scenario, the probability of each node, each leaf node is 0 0.125. So we create a stochastic programming formulation for this problem. I didn't get that. Sorry. Um, so we create a stochastic programming formulation for this problem um, where we try to minimize the expected cost of supplying electricity demand under the election related uncertainty. So we have this one extreme um, scenario here where one party wins for three consecutive years. And we have another extreme scenario here where the other party, the pro-business party wins for three consecutive um, time stages. So if we don't have any um, policy constraints in that extreme scenario, the last scenario, this would this is how the electricity generation profiles would look like over the next few time periods. Yeah. But in contrast, if we um, again look at the, the other extreme scenario where we have emission cap every year, then this is how the carbon, the electricity generation profile would look like over the next 10, 20 years, right? So as you can see, just a small change in that policy can mean a big difference in what kind of resources would stay um, as we go ahead, uh, what kind of resources we will still use for electricity generation. So we, compute EVPI and ECIU for all of these scenarios, assuming different number of stages in our problem. So two number of stages only solves problem for 2016 and 2020, only has two scenarios, right? The three stage problem will have scenarios also for 2024. So what this tells us is the economic value of knowing the results of the election or economic value of ignoring the uncertainty related to election. Okay. So one thing I wanted to note here is that the computational time uh, for two stage, three stage and four stage problem is given here. And as you can see, it increases basically exponentially as we increase the number of stages. So the this is a small example that we, um, that might help you understand how, um, particular technique can be used in the real world problem. The next case study that we did was for the robust optimization problem. And for this, we had a nine region um, US model for the entire energy system of US. So we have data about generation technologies. We have data about residential sector, industrial sector, commercial sector technologies um, or um, transportation sector technologies. Okay. So in all of these technologies, we had around 2,500 uncertain parameters where we had uncertainty about investment cost uh, trajectories. And we also had uncertainty about fuel cost trajectories. And as we know that fuel cost of next year depends on the fuel cost of the previous year. So there is a correlation over there. And same thing with the investment cost. So with, when we saw when we created a robust optimization formulation for this problem, it gives us this, these numbers. Right. So the red line here is the probability of n number of uncertain parameters taking worst case value. So since we had around 2,500 uncertain parameters, the model is telling us that more than 7% of them taking their worst case value is practically zero. So at 7% solution, so we find a solution, robust solution 
assuming 7% budget of uncertainty. So this solution here is the cost of a robust solution, assuming 7% budget of uncertainty, but when different number of different number of uncertain parameters take their worst case value. Yeah. This line here shows the cost of the deterministic solution that did not consider any uncertainty. So if we take a decision based on deterministic solution, and if 7% parameters take their worst case value, our total system cost is going to increase by 200%. But in contrast, if we take a decision based on robust solution, our total system cost is going to increase by 90%. But then what happens if we take a decision based on robust solution, but nothing really takes worst case value, everything falls in at nominal value. So this blue line here then shows you the premium that you would need to pay for achieving that robust solution in order to save this potential difference between deterministic cost and robust cost. Does this make sense? So it, it's kind of like an insurance premium that we pay, just a small amount that we pay to save large amount in the future. Yeah, it's a really good way to describe it. We pay for insurance all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. A similar thing for a power system planning. Um, these are some of the results that we got from that robust optimization case study. For the year 2020, 2030, and 2050, we have worst case value. That means a strategy if all of the parameters take their worst case value. Naive solution, which is a strategy that does not consider any uncertainty. And a different solutions that assume different level of budget of uncertainty. So this solution here at 7% uh, basically tells you that that solution is going to um, give you a more robust strategy for future capacity expansion planning in the US. Um, I think that's it. That's basically the end of the lecture. And if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thanks, Neha. Yeah. Questions from folks? So these are very useful um, optimization frameworks that are quite commonly used for research purposes in a variety of, of you know, contexts, given how much uncertainty we face in, especially in long-term planning, but also in operations, as I mentioned, the commitment of reserve products and dealing with forecast errors in wind and solar and demand and things like that. Um, so you encounter them a lot in literature and you should think about whether using one of these methods might be, um, something you want to tackle in your term projects as well. If the kind of area that you're thinking about studying has these sorts of characteristics, either some kind of risk, you know, risk it, um, risk averse nature to the point, you know, the problem or a good known probability of, you know, various outcomes that you can use in a stochastic context. Um, I have a quick question. Um, for like this is kind of towards the beginning for the um, stochastic linear programming. Um, can you explain again like the meaning of like the profit that you get from hedging? Oh, uh, okay. Might take me a bit. To yeah, go. sorry. <laughs> I have to make you come back all the way. Yeah. Uh, so. This is. This is what you wanted to understand, the expected profit? Um, so I guess for, I think more for the equations for EDPI and- Oh, UCI, okay. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, for ECIU, like how the hedge profit like comes into play. I guess I had a little trouble understanding that formulation. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll go through the example. So we want to calculate EDPI, right? And we, this term here, 
tells you the profit given the perfect foresight about a particular scenario. So we have only two scenarios. So we could have only two perfect foresights. Either we know with certainty that tomorrow is going to be windy or we know with certainty that tomorrow is going to be sunny. So if tomorrow is windy, then it's obvious that if we use all wind, we will make the most profit. Okay, hundred dollars is the max of all three possibilities. And if we know with perfect foresight that tomorrow is going to be sunny, then sixty dollars is the maximum profit that we can make. So profit PF for scenario N is the profit that you can make if you knew that that exact scenario is going to occur. So, but in reality, we do not know what exactly is going to happen. So in reality there, if the probability of this scenario was 0.5, then probability of you making a profit of $100 is 0.5. And probability of making that $60 profit is again 0.5. So if you knew with certainty what is going to happen tomorrow, then overall you could make a profit of $80 on an average or weighted average. But instead you did not know what tomorrow is going to be like. So as a result, you chose a hedging strategy. So since you did not know what is going to happen tomorrow, that was your potential profit, but you could not make that because you did not know what's going to happen. So the difference between the two is the value of having that perfect information. Okay. Yeah. And so like you choose the, I guess I don't understand the part, like you choose the hedge profit. Oh, uh, hedging profit was from this scenario, right? That we, um, computed for the uh, okay. yeah this was the optimal scenario like um, if we maximize the profit expected profit then our hedging strategy gives us a $50 profit so profit of that hedging strategy was $50 we solved um, this pro linear programming problem we solved this linear programming problem to get that hedging strategy assuming that probability was 0.5. Okay. So a solution for this problem um, is equal to the profit of the hedging strategy. Okay. I get how it comes together. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, did you also want to know about ECIU? I did not go over that. Um, actually, yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So ECIU is again, um, think of it as if you make a decision and that decision turns out to be wrong. So you are going to pay for that wrong decision or it's that wrong decision is going to cost you something. So ECIU is a profit if scenario N occurs, but you have made a decision based on a certain scenario. So you assume that tomorrow is going to be windy, but it could be windy or sunny, right? Um, so when making a decision, you did not take that into consideration. So you set Y1 equal to one, which means that if it turns out windy, you will get a hundred dollar profit. If it turns out sunny, you would lose, you, you would lose $10. So you made a decision based on a knife or like based on your hunch, but the probability distribution exists, right? For windy and sunny, which is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So your hunch turned out to be wrong. So if you take a decision based on your hunch, your expected profit would be $45, right? Which is le $5 less than how much you would have made if you used the hedging strategy that the stochastic programming analysis told you about. 
so this is basically the cost that you had to pay for ignoring the uncertainty and just taking a decision based on your hunch okay same for sunny and then we take the probability weighted average okay got it thank you so much mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, it, is it true to say that the robust optimization approach is like always more risk averse? And do can we quantify like the cost of this risk aversion to the taxpayer or whoever's gonna be paying for this policy? Right, so um, this figure, sorry, I didn't take, yeah. So this figure basically tells you that cost of that risk aversion or risk neutrality. So this point here is the cost of a robust solution. If all of your 2,500 uncertain parameters take their worst case value, right? So if the decision maker makes a decision based on this robust strategy, a cost, a taxpayer or like yeah, taxpayer would be would be saving this amount of money due to if the decision maker makes that robust decision. But if the decision maker does not make that robust decision, then we could be paying much higher. Right? This is the amount that we would be paying um, if the uncertainty is resolved at the worst case values of all the parameters which is like the probability of which is near zero. But this line tells you how much a taxpayer would pay if the decision maker do not take the decision based on, uh, without considering uncertainty. And this is, uh, this is how much the taxpayer would pay if the decision maker takes a decision based on um, the robust solution. But as we know that prob, in reality, only a certain small part of uncertain parameter take their worst case value. So let's say if the decision maker is okay with um, like 15% uh, uncertainty, which is given on this axis, the probability of n number of uncertain parameters taking their worst case value. So if the decision maker is okay with this kind of uncertainty, then um, we would have to pay this much premium. So taxpayer, to begin with, would have to pay around 5% more than what the least cost solution would have to pay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Any last questions? Okay, thanks Neha.